Hi, I'm Exoticon of Icebird. Today, I would like to introduce you to size coding for Microwait. Microwait is a new WebAssembly-based fantasy console that I'm working on. If you have ever written code for, say, TIG80, then Microwait should look somewhat similar in terms of API. The main difference being that instead of writing Lua code, you are either writing directly in WebAssembly or using some kind of language that can compile to WebAssembly, like C, Rust, Zig, Go, or whatever. In our case, we probably want the most control over the code, so we will be writing WebAssembly directly. The homepage for Microwave can currently be found at exoticon.github.io slash microwave. At some point in the future, it will likely get its own domain, but for now, this is where you can find it. On this website, you will find a short overview of what Microwave is, some examples that you can just run by clicking them. I have no idea why that flickers right now, it's only doing that in the recording. Um, and some downloads for your favorite platforms to get you started with developing for Microwave. Really all you need to get started coding for this platform is one of these downloads and a text editor. Then back at the top, you have a link to the docs. Those include a memory map, the API functions, um, and some info about the UW8 tool. This tool is essentially your Swiss army knife for developing for Microweight. All you really need to get started is that and a text editor, as I said. Going back, um, the big screenshot on the home page takes you to the web runtime. Here you can load um, Microweight cards simply by pressing the load card button down here, or you can just drag and drop a file onto uh, the screen area to run it. One neat feature is that for cards that are small enough, um, up to one kilobyte in size, the card is actually automatically encoded in the URL. So you can just copy that, send it to someone else, and they can click on it and run your effect right in their web browser without doing anything else. Um, also, the size of the card is nicely uh, displayed at the bottom there. So this makes it very convenient to just share small effects with people. So now say you have downloaded the microwave distribution from these uh, download links here. Um, what does it actually get you? First of all, as I said, you have the UW8 tool. As I said, this and a text editor is all a size code I should need to code for the microwave platform. Then there is microwave.html, which is the web runtime. This is a single self-contained, relatively small HTML file so that you can just include it into your productions. So people downloading a zip of your cool new intro don't have to hunt for the right version of the microwave runtime. Instead, they have just everything included they needed to run your intro. Then we have a couple of examples uh, in source code and also just the same examples compiled to microwave modules. So now let's see how to actually use these tools to make some intro for microwave. First off, if you run the UW8 tool, you just get a quick little usage information here. Um, there are a few subcommands that can be quite useful, but for the most part, you just use the run subcommand. 
the run command can, well, first of all, it can just run final compiled microwave cards, like for example, this here, but can also load WebAssembly modules in both binary and text format. So for example, let's take a look at the source crawl dot uh, module you see on the right. This is the official text representation for WebAssembly. And it looks a bit like a cross between Lisp and an assembler. It's not totally horrible to write by hand, but arguably we can do better. WebAssembly has functions, locals, um, it has an expression stack, it has a scoped control flow, like this loop construct here, and all of that can be just as well represented using a much more familiar infix syntax. So that's essentially what I set out to do with curly bus. And to me, that's the recommended way to code for microwait. And so the run command can obviously also load curly bus source files. Really, it's just an alternative syntax for WebAssembly. It shouldn't be considered its own programming language. But it should look a lot more friendly and familiar to most people coming to this new platform. That's why I recommend it. But in the end, if you want to go with the official WebAssembly text format, then that's certainly totally fine as well. So let's start writing our own little effect. Let's just do a simple tunnel, because I guess I'm just not very original. To start off, we need some way to plot to the screen. Um, first off, to use any of the API functions, we need to first import them. So we do import env.setpixel. Um, locally, we can just pick any name we like for it. To show that off and for familiarity to tick 80 coders, let's just call it pix. We also need to specify the correct types for the function parameters. In this case, it's just uh, x, y, and color index, all integers. Any microwave module has to export one function called upd, or update. This is called once per frame, um, or 60 times a second. And this is where all of your drawing and update stuff will happen. For now, let's just plot a single pixel in the center of the screen, just to see that everything works so far. The screen size of microwave is 320 by 240. So now let's run this. We will use the minus W or watch parameter to watch for file changes and automatically restart the code whenever we save a new version. We will use the minus P parameter to automatically pack our code into a microwave module or card, which removes some of the overhead of standard WebAssembly modules. Essentially, there are quite a few mandatory sections in WebAssembly modules, which we don't really need. And so in a microwave module or card, we can just leave them out and get sensible defaults for those sections. And then we can also use minus O to write out the packed uh, microwave card to a file. And so just run it. And I'm not sure that you can actually see that in the recording, but there is a small dot here in the center of the screen. So now we actually want to plot more than a single pixel. For that, we will need some kind of loop. 
So let's start by just declaring a local variable with let, let y equals zero, and write a loop. Now, this loop construct, it might look a little bit like your usual loop, but it really isn't. It's better to think of it as a block of code with a named label at the top. And inside of this block of code, you can have branch instruction which jump back to the top. There is also a corresponding construct called block, which is a block of code with a label at the bottom. And so branch instructions inside that block can branch out of the block. But for now, we just need a loop. Just to reiterate, this really is just a label. On its own, it's not doing anything. Right now, we don't have a branch. So if we just run this, then we still have the same one pixel. Um, there's no endless loop or anything. Uh, it's just wasting a little bit of space and doing nothing. So let's just update our y variable. And now um, this is just an unconditional branch. What we want is a conditional branch, so branch if. Then we have a condition, in this case y is smaller than 240, and branch back to the label y. Um, and now we can do the same for x. Just initialize to zero, write the loop construct, update x, and then branch if x is smaller than 320. Um, and then we can just uh, move the pixel plotting inside of the loop and put an x, y, and just do a little XOR texture. And lo and behold, there we have a filled screen. Now, to start turning this into a tunnel, we first want to have the x and y coordinates in float and with a zero zero in the center of the screen. So let's just do that. So let's introduce a new local variable for that and um, cast x to float and subtract 160 pixels from that. Then do the same with y. And now the first thing we need for our tunnel is the distance from the center of the screen. Um, WebAssembly has a built-in square root instruction. We can just use that here. And, well, let's just call that radius um, and say distance is now some large constant divided by radius. And so distance is just uh, yeah, distance from the camera. And to plot that, we just cast it into an integer and see how that goes. Well, that's at least at the top half of a tunnel. But we do get an integer overflow in the center because the radius gets to zero. That's a division by zero and the resulting value can't be cast into an integer. There are basically two ways to solve that. Uh, the easiest is just to uh, add, say, half a pixel to x. And then x never goes to zero. Uh, the radius never goes to zero and we don't get a division by zero. So that way we now have a full tunnel. The next step, I guess, is to get it to move. And for that, we can just add the time here. Um, first, we need to import another function just called time. And it just returns uh, a floating point number of seconds since the start of the card. 
So let's just add that to our distance here and see whether the tunnel moves. Well, we should call the function actually. Okay, there we have it. It's moving now. Um, let's see whether a smaller constant, well, that's just moving faster, but it's probably a little bit too large. So let's go back to that and just um, make sure the time is moving a little bit faster. Okay, this looks fine, at least for now. So next up in our tunnel adventure, we want uh, a second axis for our texture mapping. And that's just based on the angle uh, around the tunnel. Um, for that, we just import another function, atm2, which just gives you uh, the angle from an x and a y coordinate. Basically, um, the microbate platform provides most of the standard math functions that you would expect to have. So let's just introduce well, just let's, let's just introduce some texturing coordinates, u and v. We take the function we had so far as u, and v would be based on a and 2. And let's just combine the two with our trusted claw operator. Let's see how that looks. Um, okay, uh, yeah, we need to cast to int, of course. And, well, that looks horrible. Uh, we still need to scale it so that it makes sense. So basically say we want to scale by something like, I don't know, 64 divided by 2 pi. And well, constant folding is actually the one optimization that the Curlyverse compiler does. Everything else is just in the hand of the coder to optimize. So that's okay. So now let's just add the time to that. Okay, that's not wrapping correctly. Well, it would wrap correctly if we just uh, scale to 256, but that's maybe not what we want. Instead, we can scale to a smaller value and then just use an AND to limit um, the coordinates to a smaller uh, a range. So let's just limit the range to 0 to 15. And so, okay, now we can decrease the scale here. And that looks a little more like a tunnel, actually. Okay, let's just take it like this for now. So let's just start optimizing, I guess. First up, local variables start out zero initialized in WebAssembly whenever you enter a function. So we can get rid of this assignment. Um, we do need to uh, specify a type, though, when we don't initialize uh, a variable directly. But this should make no difference at all at runtime. So next, down here we are storing into the y local variable. And then below in the branch if we are directly accessing it again. So accessing the variable is a two-byte instruction. Storing into a local variable is a two-byte instruction. But there's actually an instruction called local t, which combines the two. It stores the value at the top of the stack into a local variable, um, but keeps it on the stack for further use. So the syntax for that in Curlyverse is simply uh, a colon equals. 
so when we do that here we will see that at least the uncompressed size got a little smaller um, let's just do the same for x and then probably the compressed size will also drop there you have it Next, we probably don't really want to uh, initialize x either. But the problem obviously is that we need x to be zero every time we enter the x loop, and not just the first time in the function. So in order to do that, we need to realize that there are no bools in WebAssembly conditions are actually just integers and uh, any integer that is non-zero is treated as true. So since we want x to be zero whenever we leave the loop to be ready for the next iteration, we can just use x as our condition here and make sure that it wraps around to zero when we hit the right order. And that's just a modulo. So now x just wraps to zero. This causes the condition to fail. We leave the loop and x is zero uh, just as we want it for the next time around. So, so now we should be able to just remove the zero initialization and uh, move the variable outside of the loop and see if that helps any. Yep, two more bytes. And now, um, as I said before, the loop construct is actually basically just a label. And we now have two labels right after the other. For our code flow, it doesn't really matter which label we jump to, right? So we could just as well jump to y in the inner loop. So that should change nothing. But now we can just remove the uh, loop x because it's not used anymore. And that should save a little bit. Well, at least in the uncompressed size. The compressed size is still the same but I guess in the long run, it's still going to help a little bit. So we probably want to uh, normalize the two conditions. Just use the same kind of expression to make them as similar as possible for the compressor. And that should, again, help save a few bytes. Now, Floating point constants in WebAssembly are always four bytes, while integer constants are a variable size from one byte to five bytes. Basically, the closer you are to zero, the fewer bytes it takes. So usually if you have a whole number floating point constant, it's smaller to just use an integer constant and cast it to float. So, let's just try that for our, all of our constants here and see whether that saves anything. Uh, yes, another two bytes in the compressed version. Now, we'd also like to do that for x here, but, well, it's not a whole number yet. Um, we needed that point 0.5 to not have this integer overflow. But as I mentioned back then, there is another way to solve this overflow. And that is by using a different cast instruction. Since there is only so much you can put into syntax, um, in this case, we need to use an intrinsic, which 
looks just like a function. And I guess we need a signed cast here. Okay, let's see. Do we need a bracket? No. Okay, um, let's just delete that, that cast and see. Yeah, it works again. So now we actually don't need the 0.5 in that uh, constant up there. Awesome. Now, I guess it's a little bit wasteful to have 2 and 15 here. Uh, we can just move that after the XOR. And that should give a few more bytes, actually. Now, if we accept drawing a few more lines, we can make these two conditions more similar, which is one way to uh, please the compressor, and that saves another three bytes. Sorry about the jump cut. I totally forgot about an important optimization step when I first recorded this. So I already talked about the local t function, which combines setting a variable and uh, using the value. We actually want to use that as much as possible. For example, for our fx, we want to not set that directly, but only set it um, when it's first used here in the square root. And there is a keyword for that in Curlybus. It's called uh, lazy. This will just defer initializing the variable until its first use. So you don't have to move the initialization expression into another expression and make your code all ugly. But as you can see, this does save a few bytes. And it's just one keyword. Now, for the radius, it's only really used once, so we don't even want a local variable for that. We just want to inline it. And, well, there's a keyword for that. It's called inline. So that way you can keep your code beautiful and readable, but inline everything uh, as it makes sense to get the smallest code possible. And again, the U and V are only used once, so it makes total sense to inline them. Now, fx and fy are used twice, but let's just try inlining them anyway. We are dealing with compression, and oftentimes inlining stuff just makes everything smaller. So, yeah, this does technically duplicate code, and you see that here in the uncompressed size. But the compressed size is three bytes smaller. So, yeah. So now the whole tunnel is essentially just inlined into the setPixel function. And that's probably the smallest we can get for now without changing the effect in any way. So now one last thing I would like to show is how to debug your code, because that works actually quite well. You can use the compile subcommand to compile your curly was file into a WebAssembly module. We use the minus D switch to make it output a name section, which enables the debugger to show names for all the local variables and functions. And now we can load that WebAssembly module into the web runtime. So let's just drag the card into here, open up the debugger, um, look for the WebAssembly module. And I do recommend Chrome or its siblings over Firefox for debugging. In Firefox, you can't really inspect the stack or memory, as far as I know. But okay, yeah, here we have our disassembly. We can set breakpoints by just left-clicking 
on the address on the left. And then we can step through the code. We can uh, inspect the stack. We have our local variables here. And if we actually were to use the memory in our uh, intro, we would find a reference to the memory in the module section here. So just know that if you need it, you do have a debugger available. So I hope that gave you at least a first impression of what it might look like to do some size coding for microwave. For further inspiration, I do have a few entries in the compost this party that come with full source code, so you might want to check those out. Um, and obviously you can find us in the size coding discord. Right now we're still in the other channel. Who knows if, uh, if there's enough interest in this platform, I'm sure we can get our own channel. I am looking forward to seeing what some of you can come up with for this platform. And now I just want to say, enjoy the rest of the party. Have fun.